Ari Chakraborty from Syracuse University. We'll talk about a million excitations. So. Okay, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to do a quick audio video check so everybody can hear me and, and see my slide. Okay, well, I will uh, start off by uh, thanking the organizers, Agi and Chris, for this uh, wonderful, wonderful um, uh, event. I'm very excited to be uh, a part of it. Thanks for the invitation, and especially for this session, because uh, uh, a lot of the common themes uh, that I saw today will be reflected in my talk as well. So mainly I will be talking about excited state, distorted structures and temperature. And I'm, you know, I'm guessing it is not a coincidence that we all of us are, are in the session. It is so um, very excited to talk about, you know, in, in, in today's session. Uh, so this work, um, on nanoparticles and noisy chemical environment. Uh, this was done in collaboration with my um, graduate student, uh, let's see, Jeremy Scher, um, who was recently graduated and now is a, is a postdoc, uh, funding from NSF and Syracuse University. Uh, this is uh, the work I'm going to present is a series of uh, two or three papers that we have worked on over the years. And I will basically try to condense uh, the insights that we got from. Uh, these studies into um, into this presentation. So the objective of uh, 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 this uh, talk is that I'm interested in looking at uh, investigation of effect of uh, structure on excited state properties and and the motivation, you know, as I was saying previously, uh, was you know highlighted by previous speakers in this session. We are interested in calculation of ensemble average quantities. We are interested in looking at non-zero temperature effects, uh, contribution from distorted structures and obtaining statistical inferences such as averages, error bars, means, di di uh, distributions. Uh, and the strategy that we're gonna, I'm gonna present today uh, is called effective stochastic potential method. So I will spend a little bit of time describing uh, the, the, the need for this method Okay, and briefly give you an overview of what this method is. I will not have time to delve into the theoretical and the computational details of it, but I will give you a very uh, brief overview. And then I will talk about the chemical application. So chemical application is uh, we want to use this method uh, for calculation of optical gaps, exciton binding energies, and also um, ionization potentials in, in semiconductor quantum drive. Okay, so that's sort of is the, is the application area, but the method is general enough that we can apply for other systems as well. And recently we have started applying it on or, or organic photovoltaic systems as well. Uh, okay, so deformation, uh, I would like to point out this, you know, this is not a news to this crowd, but deformation is a consequence of non-zero temperature. And then these two things are related. At t equal to zero, we have some pristine structure of a quantum dot and at T equal to three, uh, you know, uh, uh, three hundred k. Uh, the system exists in a distribution of structures, okay? and it is not only existing in a distribution of structures uh, due to finite temperature. It is also in a condensed media. It has surrounded by solvent, and so uh, th there is a distribution of structure that exists at finite temperature in presence of solvent media, and, and it is coming from the energy exchange with the thermal bath. Uh, that causes the distribution, uh, that causes the deformation from the starting structure, which you can think about the minimum energy structure. And uh, if you're trying to, you know, simulate this thing using molecular dynamics, Monte Carlo, there are various options that people use for thermostat. I've just listed some of them. Uh, and so what we end up at the end of the day is this large number of structures that the system can exist in. And uh, the question that we posed you know, when we started this, uh, you know, this project is that I just want to calculate the distribution of excitation energies for these things, right? Or even, uh, you know, just the homo lumo gap or some whatever quantum mechanical property that you are interested in, okay? And the traditional way to do that, well, you fire up your favorite electronic structure code and give the structure and, and get the answer, okay? And that is what we call plan A. I mean, and, uh, and that has worked well if you have only 10 or hundreds of structure, but the distribution that we are looking at are in the range of 10,000 to a million, okay? And then you can imagine that the plan A doesn't work. And so the point is, what is plan B? If I, they, I have a bunch of structures, 
I want there is, that solution does exist in nature, but there is a, this huge computational bottleneck that, that cannot allow me. So that was the main, we started off with a computational challenge that how to get around this huge bottleneck of structures, uh, 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 computational bottleneck, but it turned out that there is some very interesting theoretical insight that we can get from there. Okay, so the point is that plan A will not work for the kind of samples that we are interested in. What is plan B? And that is what the rest of this talk is. Okay, so um, I just wanted to mention that do we, you know, there is a question of course that do we really need a uh, hundred thousand structures, right? And so this is uh, importance of sampling. Uh, here I'm just to show that indeed, you know, more samples are better in statistics. Uh, I, you know, my, uh, I, I showed an example of sampling the Gaussian function. So this is the exact function that, you know, um, uh, that we know the Gaussian distribution should look like. And this is what the Gaussian distribution looks like if you just sample it 100 times, 1,000 times, 10,000 times, 100,000, a million. Okay. And that tells you that if you are sampling in the range of 1,000, 100 to 1,000, you might get a very different interpretation. You might think the distribution is actually bimodal. Okay. And so, uh, and this is also known statistically, statistics are always better when you have more samples, you get more confidence in the statistics, okay? And so that's the reason why typically we want to exist, uh, you know, do a sampling in the range of 10 to the power of five, 10 to the power of six, uh, as I will show you for the distribution that is much, much noisier than the smooth Gaussian function, okay? But this is the statement of the problem. So at non-zero temperature, okay, uh, the structure, any structure or any favorite system of yours will always exist in a distribution. And then what we are interested in looking at quantum mechanical property X, what, you know, as a distribution of those structures. Okay, that is sort of is the fundamental problem we're trying to solve. The way to do that uh, is to solve the Schrodinger equation and then plot it. This is the straightforward way to do it. But of course, this calculation becomes extremely uh, extremely time consuming for large number of sample sizes. And so what is an alternate way of doing it? Okay, so, that, so if you're able to solve that, then we will answer how temperature is affecting or how thermal distortion is affecting chemical compounds and chemical processes and, and what for whatever property we are looking at. In our case, we are looking at excited state properties, but doesn't have to be excited state properties for, you know, for other, other cases. Um, and so I will start off with uh, the, the basic reason why we need to do an electronic structure calculation for each time. And so here, you know, I'm just describing a one particle Hamiltonian to describe the electronic structure, you know, we saw in the previous uh, talks about, you know, talking about energy levels. And so this is the generator of those energy levels. We can either do Hartree Fock calculation or you can do DFT, Konsham DFT calculation. It really doesn't matter for the content of this talk. So this is V effective. And the point is that when we solve the, uh, you know, pseudo eigenvalue equation, we get molecular orbitals and molecular orbital energies. And these are the one that allow us to describe the electronic structure of the system. And this is the single particle energy level that allow us to define excitation on that. Okay. Uh, and so the reason why uh, this calculation depends on a structure because of the self-consistent solution. After we solve the SCF equations, whether using Konsham or hartree uh, the one particle Hamiltonian acquires a dependence on structure R. And therefore, if you change the structure, it requires new calculation. Okay. So you did one calculation with your optimized minimum energy structure. Now you distorted that structure. You need a different Hamiltonian, the different one particle energy. And that depends uh, through this functional form, this R shows up uh, in, in H of R. And that is the reason why uh, we need to do new electronic structure calculation each time uh, we end up uh, with a new structure. And so one of the questions that we asked uh, is something called the existence of a quantum mechanical deformation potential. And so there are the questions is asked in two parts. Question number one is that, is there a potential uh, energy operator that we can add to the reference Hamiltonian to generate the deformed Hamiltonian. 
So you start with H naught and which is think about as the cone sham or the hartree fock Hamiltonian. And then you're asking, can I add something to this thing? Do I get the deformed Hamiltonian, okay? And so this is what I mean that, is it possible that such a term exists or not? And then uh, question number two is, if it is exists, can we approximate it, okay? So these are the two fundamental theoretical questions we are asking um, when, we, you know, when we started up this project. And the answer to the first part is yes. And I will show you the proof by construction so uh, we can define the deformation potential as the difference between these two Hamiltonians. And as you, can, as you can see that this is, if you define the deformation potential as the difference between these two Hamiltonians, then if you add this thing back into H naught, you will get eight deformations. So this is uh, kind of an obvious uh, sort of relationship. But the key point here is uh, we can show that this deformation potential exists because for two different geometries, R and R eta, there is a single particle Hamiltonian that exists. You can always derive a hartree fock or a Konsham Hamiltonian for any given structure. And therefore the difference must also exist. And therefore there is a one-to-one -one relationship between R eta and V dash. Okay. And so this is like a very important relationship it's rather obvious by you know proof by construction, but it was not obvious to us when we started off the, you know with this project. So what does it mean in practically? Practically, it means that uh, if you give me a set of distorted geometries, I can uniquely give you back a deformation potential that that when you add to your reference Hamiltonian, you will get back the deformed Hamiltonian the one particle Hamiltonian, okay? And so th the key point here is the existence of such a deformation potential is an exact condition. I have not made any approximation in doing this, okay? The reason why this is so important is that this gives us an alternate way of getting the deformed Hamiltonian, the, def the cone sham Hamiltonian for your, or the cone sham or hartree fock Hamiltonian for your deformed geometry by just not changing R, by, by, by getting it through the deformed Hamiltonian, uh, by deformation potential. And so in the ESP method, the effective stochastic potential method, we try to approximate this potential. Okay, so this is the second part where I say can be approximated. And the, so this is what we call the effective stochastic potential method. The exact deformation potential is replaced by an effective stochastic potential. So it is replaced by potential VF, VESP, but I claim that this is a stochastic potential. So what do I mean by a stochastic potential is that the matrix elements of this ESP potential are a bunch of random numbers, okay? So this is very, uh, I would say unusual because typically operators in quantum mechanics, they are very well defined. But here, what we are saying is, uh, these operators are actually stochastic in nature. They are just a bunch of random numbers, okay? Um, and so the way to so the recipe, and I will show that again later, to get the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian or the cohn sham Hamiltonian, what we are claiming is just add random numbers to the original reference structure, the minimum energy structure. And this is this recipe sounds very, very... Uh, uh, you know, uh, unusual. However, the key point, the random numbers are drawn from a probability distribution function, FPDF. So these are not uniform random numbers. So these are not white noise, okay? It is completely opposite of a white noise. It has a very specific distribution and that would be called FPDF, okay? And then I can show that by carefully choosing what this probability distribution function is, I can recreate the ensemble property of a collection of structures. Okay, so that is that is done through a formal construction. This is I mean, mentioned formal construction because uh, you know uh, this is formal, uh, exact mathematically. Okay, we cannot. There, we need to make additional approximations to make it implement on a computer. Okay, so the step one is construct a set of all possible structures a system can exist in. So this is a set and it is an infinitely large set. 
you generate the set of deformed potentials for that structures. Okay, that I, I mentioned that that map exists. And then you calculate all the moments associated with it. So you're calculating all the central moments associated with each matrix element of that deformation potential. So this is again, uh, you know, M goes from, you know, two to infinity. Uh, we have to uh, also do a Boltzmann weighting of this because we are doing a non-zero temperature. And um, then we basically do a moment matching. We search for a PDF that generates identical moments. And that is the probability distribution function from which uh, the uh, deformation potential is constructed. So here is an example of how you would do it for water. Uh, you have a bunch of structure for water, do a SCF calculation, calculate the Fock matrices from there. And then from a set of Fock matrices, calculate their moments. Uh, so this is the first moment and the second moment. From there, we basically uh, get Gaussian uh, random numbers, and then you can sample uh, stochastically from that distribution. So that's how you will construct practical application of, uh, uh, of the uh, deformed Hamilton, uh, of, of the uh, deformed, in this case, effective stochastic potential. So this is the this is the overall uh, theoretical content of, uh, of this approach that you replace the ensemble average calculation that you would have done for each individual quantum dots by a stochastic potential that uh, captures the ensemble property of these dots. And so this is how the distribution looks like for let's say water. Um, I want to skip this and uh, talk about uh, the distribution of this is homo lumo gap for water. And you can see uh, we get very good results if we were doing this calculation uh, using the direct method where we basically look at 5,000 samples of water molecules, do the calculation or use the ESP method. Okay. So the remaining five minutes that I have, I want to show you how we applied this method for a PBS system. Okay. And so we are looking at excitation energies in, in, in PBS systems. Uh, this is sort of is the linear response TDDFT approach um, that, that is commonly used. So we use that. Um, this is the distribution of structures that we got. Uh, and uh, we are looking at temperature effects. So I wanted to show you that do we do indeed have a Boltzmann distribution? Uh, the blue. Uh, bar graphs are the theoretical uh, expected distributions and uh, the orange one are the samples in our way. So you can see that this is indeed a canonical ensemble. The, the structures are distributed as expected using Boltzmann distribution. And so this is the results from the distribution of the excited state energy in PBS systems. We looked at three uh, dot ranges PB4, S4, PB20, and S20, and PB40, PS3. What we are looking at, x-axis is excitation energy, y-axis is the population okay, of them as a function of temperature. And so, uh, and so this is the distribution, and this is the cumulative uh, probability uh, density, so CDF. Um, uh, what we see over here, so this dotted line is the zero Kelvin result. And so immediately what we see that uh, majority of the structure has smaller excitation energy than the zero K structure. So this is zero K. And then uh, this thing is as we increase temperature. Okay. The mode and the average of this distribution in all cases were found to be red shifted with respect to increasing temperature. Okay. Uh, we found that the small clusters show higher sensitivity uh, as compared to the um, uh, to the big clusters, although the big clusters have a wider range. And the distribution is, is very, very non-Gaussian. And we did some statistical analysis. We looked at the kurtosis and the, and the skewness of it. Um, and we found them to be very, very non-Gaussian. And so again, I wanted to highlight, coming back to my point, the reason why we started doing that uh, is uh, the importance of large samples. So if you said, well, I am going to do only 100 electronic structure calculation, this is what the distribution we will get. 1,000, a little bit less noisy, 10,000, and a million. 
And so you can clearly see the, the importance of including more sample size. And I mean, of course, this is not a new result. This is well known that, you know, uh, your, the relationship between population mean and sample mean it does decrease as a one over square root of n sample. So more samples will definitely reduce the noise in the distribution. However, and this is, this is the reason that started it all, timing info, okay? So the projected time to do CIS calculations for these systems, uh, in terms of years, uh, for the biggest one is 1400, for the smallest one is 0.4, okay? And when we did the ESP CIS method using the stochastic sampling, uh, this is now in days. So this took about a week worth of calculation. This was, you know, done in a single day. And so this is the main reason why, you know, we, we were interested in this because these distributions do exist in nature, but it was this huge computational bottleneck that prevented us from doing that. Okay. Um, and so our next goal is to go bigger quantum dots and, and, and look at other systems. So I just wanted to mention because there was a uh, discussion of ionization potentials, we are currently working on looking at temperature effect on IP and to see how the IP changes because of this one, we use a green function approach to do that. I, I'm running, I am out of time anyways, so I will not dwell on that. Go to the main, you know, main summary slide. Uh, in this slide, we did introduce the uh, effective stochastic potential method for perf as an efficient route for performing electronic structure calculation for an ensemble of structures. Uh, we introduce a concept of a deformed potential that connects the one particle Hamiltonians of reference and deformed structures. And then we constructed an approximate effective stochastic potential uh, that satisfies a subset of metrics, in this case, means and variance, okay? And then finally, we did a computer implementation of the ESP method using Gaussian random matrices. Uh, in terms of the application to PBS, uh, Temperature effect, the distort, distribution of excited energies is found to be redshifted with increasing temperature. Uh, the distorted structures are more likely to have a lower excitation energy. Then this is coming from the non-symmetric nature of the distribution, which means that on an average, if you take a PVAC structure and distort it, chances are you're more likely going to reduce the energy excitation energy than increase it. We can say that with confidence because we have a distribution of structures to back that up with. Uh, the distribution, as I mentioned, were, were found to be non-Gaussian with significant skewness and kurtosis values. Uh, large quantum dot exhibited a broader distribution of energies, uh, but were found to be less sensitive, okay? That distribution did not change that much with temperature, but, but the smaller dots, they so showed a stronger variation. And so the results from this calculation demonstrate the importance of including low energy distorted structure and calculation of excitonic properties. It's really important to focus not only just on the minimum energy structure, which of course has the highest Boltzmann probability, but also low energy distorted structures surrounding that minimum energy structures, which are uh, in principle, infinitely many. So with this, I just wanted to put on the references for these two papers uh, on which uh, the theory of this and the results were presented. And then uh, about another paper that uh, talks about efficient calculation of electronic structure energy. So with this, I would like to end my talk. Thank you all for your, uh, uh, for your um, uh, attention and I will be happy to answer questions. Right, awesome. There's there's hope, basically. Although I will we'll see when you start putting ligands on the surface, then you'll your uh, your parameter space will increase. Uh, yes, a lot. <laughs> yes, and that is that is sort of is the next step that we are going. And 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 I'm glad you mentioned that. And that is the reason why I meant you know I I, I said I pointed to this reference because that's what we are working on. That's the next step for us. Okay, uh, I'm going to plunge into the questions from the chat uh, from Doran Bennett. Is there any guarantee about how large a moment of the distribution I need to consider in order to act accurately capture the ensemble properties? Is there a guarantee of convergence in the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors with respect to the moment of, divert of uh, the distribution? That's a very good question. And uh, uh, the short answer is there is no guarantee. These, uh, hmm. they, we, they, because uh, mathematically, 
we cannot claim that if you truncate up to 10th moment, you're good enough. Mm -hmm. So it is, you have to think about it in the same way that we think about uh, perturbation theory that we are making series of approximation that gets us closer to the exact answer. And that, that is my approach. So I, I do not think about this method as sort of the last word uh, about the distribution, I, I have an opposite view that this is the first one. This is the this is the first zero order description of what it looks like. Uh, okay, uh, that 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 sounds like there's always room for more. Uh, from Pablo Videla, uh, if you have two different zero Kelvin minima structures, would that lead to uh, you know does that lead to a unique probability distribution, or do you end up with two different probability distributions? You know, so, because you have this this degeneracy, I guess. Yeah. So, and and I'm glad you you asked that question because we have grappled with that. Uh, a very good system will be uh, systems with torsion. So, uh, we looked at n butane very extensively mm -hmm. because you can think about them as different you know torsional minima and and the, uh, so the answer is that if you have the distribution, uh, is still one distribution, but it is coming from contributions of different R, R not, so to speak. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what we have done in our preliminary calculations on, on this is to capture the distribution from two different R values. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that can be done. So, so the distribution is, mm -hmm. is unique. There is no, uh, I would say, equivalent distribution that, you know, that, but the contribution to the distribution is coming from one, more than one geometry. And you see that not only for zero K, but also for finite, you know, non-zero K, uh, non-zero temperature effects as well, uh, where you where the uh, this uh, where the contribution to the final distribution is coming from not a single geometry, but a collection of equally important geometries, and that is coming from two or more geometry that have the same or identical or numerically identical Boltzmann contributions. So I think related to that question, I think you I think you sort of answered this question from Justin, which is what if there are two or more dominant isomers that that give rise to very different exotonic features? Can you still capture them, say your bimodal distribution? Yes, yes. So okay. because the, the key point here is, and, and this is a very subtle, when we think about distribution, at least for, for the Boltzmann or the distribution is not in our space, mm -hmm. it is an energy space, right? And so two different geometries, they, if they have the same energy, they, they are a single point in that energy space. Mm -hmm. So they contribute equally. Now, uh, and so when we are constructing the distribution, we have to be mindful that we are, we are including contribution from that geometry. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the, the distribution might be intrinsically multimodal Okay, but that multimodal is non-obvious just by looking at the geometries because the distribution we're talking about, the x-axis, is energy scale. Mm -hmm. Right, but you you still get that you you still fully take into account you know the into account those contributions from the different. Yes. You know that does sound okay. So uh, now a technical, more technical question from Amro Dodin: Are the matrix elements correlated in your sampling scheme, or can you independently sample the elements? Oh, that, that's a wonderful question. I'm glad you asked uh, about this. We spent so much time on this problem. <laughs> so the answer is yes, they are correlated. If you treat them as independent, uncorrelated, uh, you get completely messed up results. So, oh. and so, yeah, mm -hmm. so I, I would like to just point to one slide that we that I had, you know, and it is this thing, um, what we use uh, uh, is the an uh, eigenbasis transformation. So F naught, all these elements of F naught are correlated to each other because they all correspond to a single geometry, right? If you change the geometry, all of these numbers mm -hmm. are going to change. Right? So they are correlated. But now if you transform them, and so you say, well, I have to deal with an N cross N correlated problem because all there are N cross N elements in there and they're all correlated with each other. But, but if you diagonalize it, then all of them are exactly zero and the correlation is only along diagonal. So by diagonalizing, you can reduce the number of correlated correlation from an N cross N problem to an N problem. Here you have to deal with only N 
numbers that are correlated with one another. Here you have to deal with n squared numbers that are correlated with one another. So we use this eigenbasis transformation to reduce the correlation between numbers. So, and that, that has, so it took us a while to figure out this trick, but yes, if you, do, if you neglect them, then it is a, it is a big problem. So huh. definitely, definitely include correlation. Okay. So I think, I think now in view now, it's now 10 a.m. So we are now at the official end of this workshop. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers, Ari, Sean, Kathy, and Justin for uh, awesome talks. Uh, this is the last workshop of the year. So we'll, we, I guess we have to figure out what we're going to do for next year. Um, but we still will have informally, we're going to keep the Zoom window open. And if people want to stick around, chat, or ask more questions, I know Sogi has a question for you, Ari. So, <laughs> you know, we are going to keep the Zoom window open. But, it, you know, the official part of the workshop and the recording, should we stop the recording? Yes, we can. Yeah, we're going to stop the recording. And that, this, is it, this is it for what will be posted. <laughs>